Some people just didn't want to change. They just weren't going to be progressive in any way. And now we look back and we say, Jesus, do they ever allow smoking in restaurants? You know, in a lot of states now. But I began to work on campaigns like that, uh, state cigarette tax hikes, uh, many different policy issues. I was able to, you know, work, you know, stump for ballot measures in various communities. And I answered the call and got more and more involved. As I began to get more involved in the movement, I became noticing that there was one particular thing. Uh oh. That was both their slide order got reversed, but that was me going up on the plane, and then I got to meet that guy. I was wondering where that slide was. Okay. And um, I got more committed to the cause, and I noticed one thing that kept coming back. But before I get into what that was, I will show you a video. Uh, of a public service announcement that we did for the Truth Campaign. This particular one won a Clio. Do you know what's in cigarettes? No. Because the last thing the tobacco companies want is for you to know how many poisonous chemicals there are in cigarettes. So they just don't tell you. Not in the pack, not in their ads. I'm Patrick Reynolds, the grandson of R.J. Reynolds. My family's name is printed on the side of seven billion packs of cigarettes every year. Why am I telling you this? Because I want my family to be on the right side for a change. You know, folks, they say that you find within your deepest wound, where you have been hurt the most deeply, your calling. Sometimes that's where you find your gold, what you're supposed to do with your life. It's the ex-alcoholic who becomes a good speaker on alcohol, the ex drug addict who becomes a good speaker on drugs. And within my deepest wound, not having my dad in my life. And in that wound, I found what I was supposed to do. Now, as I worked on the political campaigns to raise state cigarette taxes or uh, stump for a smoking ban, whether partial or 100% over the years, I began to notice you know, more and more about the opposition. And I began to have a central theme something that I kept seeing over and over in state after state. And it was the influence of the tobacco company's money. I don't know where we are in the show. So maybe a little help to get to the next slide. Uh, the tobacco company's money. Oops, I'm looking for a shot of the, that's the one. Thanks. See, winners get help. <laughs> Their money, their influence over our politicians and our elected officials. The campaign donations are obscenely huge. Philip Morris is one of the largest campaign donors in the country, if not the largest. And it so happens, um, well, we'll talk a little bit about this briefly, but I think I have to say this. I hesitate, but it needs to be said without being political, but simply educational that 80% of Big Tobacco's donations have gone to Republican candidates and PACs, and that in the Bush years, we could not get FDA regulation of tobacco. We could not get a 61 cent federal cigarette tax hike from Congress. Even though that tax hike would bring in revenue, it would stop children from starting to smoke. It would give smokers a strong financial incentive to quit. And with less smoking, of course, what do we save on health care? It's in the billions, billions with a B. We couldn't get it done under Bush. Now the Democrats have their own bugaboos. You know, the trial lawyers, of course, are way too influential over them, and so on. So both of the parties need to stop taking political campaign donations. We need campaign finance reform. One of my favorite politicians in Washington is John McCain, because McCain went against the majority of his party when he advocated a strong tobacco settlement of those lawsuits by the states. McCain's a good guy, and there are some bad Democrats. But he went against the majority of his party. And we also saw, um, you know, within, take, within two weeks of taking office, President Obama passed a 61 cent, and the Democratic Congress gave us a 61 cent federal cigarette tax hike within two weeks. 
Uh, and by June, we had FDA regulation of tobacco. No president in history has done more to come down on the tobacco industry than the Obama administration. And it just has to be said out loud. And I want to say one more thing about it, and that's this. I try to understand, and what came to me was this. We live in a complex time. We live in a complex time with very complex problems. But we don't have time to examine those problems and look for solutions to these incredibly complex issues that we face. So we come up with simple solutions that are inappropriately simple. Taxes are bad. We don't need government in our lives. These kind of oversimplifications, I think, are very dangerous. Now, my friend Tom Shackman, with whom I wrote The Gilded Leaf, and he's now written 34 books, he published a book called The Forty Years' War. And it's interesting. He talks about in it the ongoing battle within the conservative party between the ideologues and the pragmatists. Now, the ideologues are the ones who are saying, you've got to stick by the rules, and these are the rules, because that's what people understand. And no taxes are bad, and regulations are bad. And against them were the pragmatists. Now, when Nixon wanted to open China back in the day, the ideologues in the Nixon administration clamored. And they said, they're a communist country. We can't open China. Nixon was a pragmatist. And he had the vision to open China. And whether that was good or bad, I'm not an expert. But I'm just pointing out that you cannot take a rule, an ideological rule, and have it work in every single situation. And tonight, we will discuss tobacco taxes as one example of a really good tax. And so when we hear that you know taxes are bad, it's just an, a gross oversimplification. Good government, in short, requires a little, you know, it requires fine tuning. And uh, the pragmatists understand that in either party. So we hopefully will have campaign finance reform one of these days. Let's talk about tobacco advertising. Uh, this is, these are images I'm going to show the children tomorrow. They began adding not just candy flavorings like coconut and lime, as they did here, but referencing alcoholic beverages, clearly targeting kids. And I'm going to ask the children tomorrow, as I ask you to open your hearts, I will say to them, open your hearts. Know what you're feeling. Are you a little angry about this? Are you a little sad about it? Wow. And they won't hear anything about the ideologues and the pragmatists. They don't need to hear that. But I'm going to ask them how they feel. Oh, mint and toffee with a pretty girl in the ad. How do you feel about this kind of marketing? How about berry? Add some flavor to your party. They weren't going after, uh, they were not going after adults with these. Because they know that six out of 10 smokers started smoking before the age of 14. Nine out of every 10 smokers became addicted before reaching age 19. So I'll tell the children that, and I'll point out that if they don't get you by 19, they are not going to get you as customers. They won't have you spending $1,500 to $2,000 a year to maintain your addiction to their deadly products. I'll talk to them then about how hard it is to quit. 95% of people without a program to quit go back to smoking within 12 months. And there I will re re bring up that theme, people who succeed best get help. They connect with other people. With the best programs we have, nicotine replacement therapy, uh, 85% go back to smoking within 12 months. It is almost impossible to stop smoking once they get a teenager hooked. It is addictive beyond what I can explain in this talk. I will tell them that. So it's easier not to get hooked in the first place. And I wish Michigan was spending more money on tobacco prevention, but they're not because the states are broke. Most of the states aren't spending the money. They went after not just 
uh, African Americans, because they know the smoke more cools, but they also more menthol in it. So they went after African American women. I will ask the girls in the audience, how do you feel about that? Inviting and surprising, mocha taboo will entice you with its sweet indulgence. I mean, who wrote that? Deep in velvety, Midnight Berry surrounds you with the enchantment of the darkest night. I used to be an actor. I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> but those days are gone. But when I was very young, I got to star in one movie as a robot who was metal from the neck down. Mm -hmm. And I was mandroid. And I had dialogue like, somebody says, hey, man, do you need some body work? And I go, you're the one who needs body work. <laughs> <laughs> Eliminators. Do not rent it. It's only on VHS, so most of you can't, <laughs> can't look at it. I don't tell the kids that because it's just better. You know, I think it's best forgotten. OK, uh, that piece of advertising. That is the most egregious abuse of the First Amendment that I've ever seen. We've got a rapper and a DJ and a hip hop artist on the cover. How do you feel about that? It is outrageous. And you know, I try to explain to the children that why is tobacco advertising even legal? They want to know. I say, well, one of the things I'm going to do today is we're going to revive an ancient tradition, I'll do this tomorrow, of initiation. They would take the children, the teenagers, in the forest or the desert, and they would initiate them into life, often by making them uncomfortable, introducing pain, depriving them of sleep, depriving them of food. I will not tell them that in traditional initiation, they would get a ritual wound or cut in most of the tribes on every continent around the world. They would get this ritual cut because there's too much tattooing and piercing going on. So we'll avoid that. But I just say that they put obstacles in their path. They introduce some kind of pain into the teens' lives. And I could never understand why they did this. And one day, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I got it. It was as though the elders were trying to say to the kids, until today, you've been a child. We adults have done our best to shield your eyes from the evil and the pain in this world. But today, I want to gently, in a little pre-initiation for the middle schoolers, because they're growing up fast, to pre-initiation to gently open the eyes and let them know that there are some bad people out there. There are tobacco industry marketing executives who do not care about your health. They're in the corporate machine if they don't serve the profit motive at R.J. Reynolds, which owns Cool now. They're fired. <laughs> the machine tosses them out. I miss the mom and pop business owners on Main Street. But the big box retailers have put them out of business because they market products cheaper and more efficiently. But mom and pops are gone. And it's sad. Well, part of the initiation is there are some bad people out there who don't care about you. And let's talk about why tobacco advertising is still legal and why it's legal. Because our founding fathers, who wrote the Constitution, the first thing they decided to change was the First Amendment. 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 First Amendment provided for freedom of speech. And freedom of speech means, I'll tell them, that, oh, if I can do this. Oh. It's all right. I'll be all right. <laughs> that I can get up on this chair and I can tell you that the sky is purple and the clouds are green. Free speech. I don't get to yell fire in here because it'd be a stampede and people would get hurt. But I have the right. You can breathe easy now. Uh, I have the right to express my opinion if it happens to be untrue, then that's my right. 